These are going to be stories, what I consider my scariest stories. So we sit here in this nice brightly lit room and we forget that a long time ago there were none of these electric lights. When the sun went down, it was dark. It was really dark and you might have a candle or you might have a lantern, but nothing to dispel all that darkness. This first story is a Celtic story called Mary Colhane. Now there was once the Colhane family and the father, he was a bit of a drunk and he came home most nights, two sheets to the wind. But he got home one night and he was really rattled and his daughter Mary said, Dad, what's the matter? And he said, oh, something spooked me by the graveyard. I got so scared, I dropped my walking stick. And she said, I'll go get it for you. And before he could say a word to her, she was off towards the graveyard. And it was beginning to get dark. And she looked over the fence in the graveyard and she could see, next to an open grave, there was her father's long blackthorn walking stick. So she boldly went up to get it and she had just put her hand out to grab it when a voice came up out of the grave saying, Mary Colhane, come get me out of this grave. And a hand reached up and grabbed her wrist, a cold, wet hand. In the dim light it seemed to sort of glow and the thing crawled up hand over hand out of the grave and got on her back. She could feel the wet arms around her neck and the bony legs came in round her waist and she had no will of her own to throw it off. And he said, stand up straight, Mary, we're going into town. And Mary, all against her will, got on the road to town. Stop, he said, and he passed a house and the thing on her back would sniff. No, move on, move on. And he passed several houses, none were good enough. And finally, she said, what are you sniffing for? And he said, young blood. And finally they stopped in front of the Donahue's house where Mary knew the four boys slept upstairs. And he said, go in here, Mary. No, someone will see us. Nobody sees me when I come to call. And she went into the door, front door and she opened it up and said, take me to the kitchen, Mary, and put on some oatmeal. And Mary did as he asked. She got a pot of water. She knew just where Mrs. O'Donohue kept the oats and she put it on, poked up the fire and began to stir it. And when it was about done, the thing climbed on her back again for it had sat down in a chair and it said, Mary, take me upstairs. No, we'll wake them. Nobody wakes when I come. And they went past the front bedroom where she thought the parents slept and then to the back bedroom where the four O'Donohue boys were. And he went first, she said, go to the bathroom, Mary, and get the straight razor and the shaving bowl. And she did just what he said. And then they went into the bedroom, and he said, slit the finger of the first boy. No, do it, Mary. And she pulled the oldest boy out from under the covers, and she slit the finger, and she let the blood drip, drip, drip into the bowl. And then she did the second boy and the third boy, and then, all against her will, she put out the soft, warm hand of the youngest child and she slit the finger and she caught the blood in the shaving bowl. And when she finished, the only one breathing in that room was her. Now take me back downstairs, Mary. And she went back downstairs and he said, pour it into the oatmeal and get two bowls and two spoons. And Mary did as he said and she split the oatmeal between the two bowls and then she poured the blood in it and stirred it up and the oatmeal turned blood red. Eat up, Mary, and he pushed a bowl towards her and the thing that had been on her back took the other bowl and began shoveling the bloody oatmeal into its mouth. Mary had just enough will left that when she went to bring the bite, she could turn her head and let the oatmeal fall into her kerchief. And finally, when the thing had scraped the last little bit and licked the spoon, he said, let's go, Mary. It's getting towards dawn. And the thing got on her back again, and they left the house. They were going down the road, and the thing pointed a long, bony f finger at a pile of rocks. He says, what do you call that field? She says, we call it the haunted field. Ha! Huh, mortals know nothing. That's not where we haunt. That's where we hide our gold. She turned, why are you telling me? Because you're coming back to the grave with me, Mary. 
And they begin to walk back towards the graveyard. And she said, are, are those boys dead? And the thing laughed again, might as well be. The only thing that could save them is a bite of that oatmeal, and we've had it all between us. Mary heard a little sound. Ur, ur, what was that? Said the thing. It's just the lost lamb calling its mother. And they walked a bit further, Mary dragging her feet and going as slow as she could, and she heard the sound again. Ur, ur, what was that? Oh, just a screech owl. Hurry, Mary. And the thing began kicking her as you would kick a horse to urge it on. And they were coming to the graveyard, and Mary was dragging her feet in the dirt. She was clinging to the wall as they went over it. And they heard the sound a third time. Ur, 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 ur. And just as they got to the edge of the grave, the thing slid off her back, and the sun came up over the tops of the trees, and Mary was free. She grabbed her father's stick, and she dragged herself home and threw herself right into bed without even undressing. Now, later in the morning, her mother shook her awake. Mary, Mary, get up, get up. A terrible thing has happened. All four Donahue boys died in their sleep. We must go to the wake. Wash, wash your face and, and get ready. And Mary's mother and the rest of the family left. And Mary took off that kerchief. And she carefully folded it up with the oatmeal and put it in her pocket and made her way to the Donahue's house. All four boys were laid out on planks in the front parlor, each as cold as clay. And Mrs. Donahue was beyond weeping. And Mary took her hand and said, I'm so sorry for your loss, Miss Donahue. If I could do something to bring those boys back, would you let me try? And Miss Donahue said, oh, Mary, I'd give you anything I have if you could bring my boys back. And Mary said, I'll take the haunted field with the pile of rocks. And Mrs. Donahue said, done. And Mary shooed everybody else out of the parlor. And she went from boy to boy, and she took a finger full of that bloody oatmeal, and she pushed it between their lips, and a breath came back into their body. And by the time she'd done all four boys, their cheeks were pink, and they were sitting up, wondering what they were doing in their best clothes, sitting in the front parlor. True to her word, Ms. Donahue gave Mary the deed to that haunted field. And after a few days, she had men move the rocks, and there was a great pile of gold under there. Mary had enough to build herself a fine white house, and she married the oldest Donahue boy. But it was a long time before she felt normal. He, he was never the same. He did not make old bones. Every night she sits by the fire and she looks out at the dark and waits for that grinning white face to come. And I must tell you this other fact, that in her house, oatmeal is never served. <laughs> and that's the end of Mary Culhane. <laughs> We should, we should tell something, I should tell something a little lighter. Long ago, there was a young man who played the bagpipes. And that was his only source of income. And during the summer, he played for many a wedding. And during the fall, there were harvest festivals. But now it was winter, and nobody had any parties, and the boy had no money, and he had no place to go. So he was walking down the road in the cold. And to make matters worse, his shoes were worn out, and the sole had come loose from the top, and with every step he shuffled up a big footful of snow. And he's walking along, and the snow is coming down, and it's getting colder and colder. But over on the side of the road, he notices a man lying in the snow. And he goes over to try to wake him, and he gives him a good shake, but it was too late. The man was dead. Oh, and he felt sorry for him, but then he looked down at his feet, he was wearing a fine pair of boots. Well, the piper tried to get the boots off, but the man had been frozen so long, the foot was upright and he could not get it off. And in disgust, he threw the foot back down and cracked off like an icicle. And he picked up the boot with the foot still in it and he dropped the other one and same thing happened. So he took the boots and he tied the laces and he put them around his neck and he went on down the road to see if he could find some place to stay. Well, he saw a little light in a cottage, and shivering and shaking, he went and he knocked on the door, and he asked if he could come in for the night, and the farmer, ah, oh, we don't have room for beggars here. Well, the farmer's wife was a tiny bit nicer than the farmer, and she said, you can sleep in the barn, but watch out for the gray cow. She bites. So the piper went in the barn, and he gathered up some straw to sleep on. Now, 
cows give off a fair amount of heat when they sleep, so the barn was not so cold as the outside. And he looked at those boots and he thought, maybe if he stuffed them under the cow, they would be thawed by morning and he could put them on before he began on his journey. So he pushed them under the cow's body and he wrapped himself in his plaid and he went to sleep. Well, he woke up shivering and cold, but sure enough, the feet were thawed out and he could pull the out of the boots. Oh, and the boots fit him just fine and they were wonderful. And then he looked at those two feet and he thought of a trick he could play on the mean farmer and his wife. So he put the two feet right by the head of the gray cow and he climbed up in the loft to hide. Now when the woman came in to milk the cow, she saw the feet and she screamed, ah! And she ran and told her husband, 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 the cow has eaten the piper. And the husband ran out and, oh no, people will blame us. They will think we killed him. Well, said the wife, you know, no one knows he's here except you and I. I think we should just bury the feet and say no more about it. So around the back of the barn, they dug a hole and they buried the two feet and they tamped down the earth and whew, then they went inside to have a cup of tea and they poured a little something in it to settle their nerves. And then they heard the bagpipes and when they looked out their window, there was the piper playing his pipes, marching round and round the tiny grave. And the husband and the wife both took to the road and they ran as far and as fast as they could. Now the piper was well pleased with his trick and when the farmer and his wife didn't come back, he went in the cottage and he ate their breakfast and he drank their tea and they still hadn't come back by dinner time. So he poked up the fire and he found some sausages. Ah, he was sitting there warming his feet by the fire when there came a knock at the door. And he went and answered the door and there was a tall, pale fellow there. And he said, come in, come in, come in. It's so cold outside. Come in and warm your poor cold feet by the fire. Feet, said the fella. Feet's what I wanted to talk to you about. And that's the end. <laughs> that story is called A Piper's Revenge. It was quite wonderful revenge, I think. This next story is from Brittany, and I found it in a wonderful book of folk tales, and it was published under the name Forgotten Books. And I have a lot of books of folk tales, and it's rare that I can get one, and really rare that I can get two, but this book had lots of really interesting stories. So this one is called Trephine. In Brittany, there was once a king who had an only child, a daughter. Ah, oh, and she was the light of his life. He would have given up all of his property and lands rather than see her sad for a moment, and her name was Trephine. Now near them, there was another king named Camor, a man so wicked, even from childhood, that when he would leave the castle, his mother would ring a certain bell to let the townsfolk know he was abroad. He had been married four times, and the wives were all dead under mysterious circumstances. Now his men came to Trephine's father and said, but King Camor had seen his daughter in the marketplace, and he had fallen in love with her, and he wished to marry her. Now the king knew of Camor's reputation. He said, oh, no, no, my, my daughter is too young to marry. And King Camor's evil servant said, he has told us to get ready for war, should you refuse. Well, the king was not going to give up his beautiful daughter. He got his soldiers ready for war, and the two armies were faced off against each other. But then Gilda, who later became Saint Gilda, went to the daughter, and he says, you must save the young men of Brittany. I have sailed here in a boat and a sail made of this very cape, and I will give you a ring, a silver, white as silk. Should the ring turn dark, you will know that Camor is plotting something evil against you. Oh, said Trephine, I will do it, but prepare to say the prayers of the dead for me, for that will surely be my fate. And so the king agreed, and the army stood down, and a grand wedding was held. And it went on day after day, and barrels of wine were drunk, and barrels of brandy. And at the end of the week, King Camor carried Trephine off like the hawk takes the dove. Now they went back to his castle and 
for a time, things were good. And his townspeople said, what has come over our king? We have never seen him so peaceful and happy. And indeed, Camor had decided that he loved Trifine, and he would do anything for her. Now, Trifine had not let down her guard, and she would go every day down to the chapel in the basement of the castle. And she would see the graves of the four wives, and she would say prayers for them. And she almost seemed to hear in the air whispered, poor Trifine, poor Trifine. Now, Kian Kamor had to leave, and he was going to be gone a long time because he had to go to a great council of all the rulers of, of Brittany. And he was gone six months. Now, when he was on his way back, he had gifts for his bride. He was looking forward to seeing her. But when he came to the chamber she was in, she was embroidering roses on a baby cap. What child is this for? And she said, it is for our child. Well, for soon we are expecting a baby. And his face grew dark and black. And when she looked down at her ring, it had turned just as dark as his face. And she knew he was plotting evil against her, though she did not know why. And she ran to hide, and she ran all over the castle until she found herself down in the chapel just before midnight. And she was praying there, and she heard louder than ever, poor Trifine, poor Trifine. And at midnight, up stood the shades of the four wives. This one green in the face, this one's neck horribly twisted. And they said, beware, for Comor is plotting evil against you. But why, said Trifine, what have I done? You carry his child. It has been foretold that his own child will cause his death and he will have none born into this world. You must flee. How will I flee? It is dark, and he has set the dogs loose. And the one who was green in the face held out a little bottle. She said, take this poison that he used on me and feed it to the dogs. How will I get over the wall, for the gates are closed? And the one whose neck was horribly twisted said, take this rope that I was hung with. It will get you over the walls. How? How will I find my way? It is dark. And another stepped forward with a torch and said, Use this. It will light your way. Oh, I am great with child. How can I walk? And the fourth wife came forward. Here is the stick he beat me with. It will lend you strength for your way. So Trophine did as they suggested. She threw the poison to the dogs, and they were down. She took the rope to the wall, and it practically threw itself over it. And she climbed up and over the wall. And she picked up the torch, and it lit her way. And using the staff, she made her way through the woods. And she walked, and she walked. Now, Kamor had sent his people to look for her, and they could not find her anywhere in the castle. And he went up to the tallest peak. And he looked to the east, and he saw crows flying. And he looked to the south, and he saw seagulls. And to, he looked to the, to the north, and he saw terns coming in. But when he looked to the west, he saw a white dove. And he says, that is the way she has gone. And he got his horse and his hunting dogs, and he took off after her. Now, Trophine had walked and walked, and she was so tired, and she began to feel the pangs of labor coming on. So she walked even faster. And she took a night's shelter in a little shepherd's hut, and someone had left a magpie in a cage there. And she was saying to herself, oh, poor Trophine, I am poor Trophine. And the magpie took up the call. And he, too, began to say, poor Trophine, poor Trophine. And the next day, she walked on and on until she could go no further. And she lay down in the forest, and she gave birth to a little boy. And she bundled him in a scarf. He was a beautiful child. But she could hear the dogs coming. She could hear a horseman. So she took the baby, and she hid him in a tree. And her ring was now dark again. And flying down came a hawk. And the hawk had jesses on it. It had those leather straps that, hawk, that people put on hawks to identify them. And she recognized it as her father's. And she took the ring, and she gave it to the hawk. And she said, take this to my father and lead him back. And the hawk took the ring in its beak, and it flew off. Now, she did not have her ring, and she did not know how close Camor was coming. And so he was able to surprise her. 
And she stood up, and he took out his cutlass, and he took off her head. And he left her and the head lying there in the leaves, and he rode back to his palace, well satisfied. But the hawk flew on, and it flew and it flew, and it came in the window of Trophine's father's castle, and it took the ring and it dropped it in the king's cup. And when he pulled it out, it was dark and gray. And he called Gilda, he said, Gilda, this is your doing. Come with me, we must find my daughter. And his men and the king saddled up and they rode and they could follow the hawk who was flying up the path ahead of them. And when they came to Trophine's body and the head, the king fell down and wept. No, said St. Gilda, rise up, rise up and pray with me. And they all prayed and he told Trophine, stand up. And the body stood up and she reached down and she put her head back on and she was as alive as anyone. And she reached into the tree and brought out the baby. This evil must end, said Gilda. And Trophine got on a horse and they rode back to Camor's castle. And she dismounted and Camor was looking down from the battlements and he saw his wife and he saw the baby. And they put the baby down, and as young as it was, it could stand up. And the baby reached down and grabbed a handful of sand, and it threw it at the castle, and every grain turned into an enormous boulder, and the castle came crumbling down with Camor and his evil retainers under the stones. And just as the dust was settling, Trophine saw the shades of the four wives ascending to heaven. Trophine went home with her son and her father and St. Gilda, and they lived happily ever after. Now before the great cut in the Catholic Church, there was a Saint Trophine, and she is, interestingly enough, the patron saint of difficult childbirths. <laughs> so, and there are little villages throughout France named Saint Trophine. So it is a great story. It is from Brittany. <coughs> And it sounds kind of Celtic to me because uh, a lot of the Celts had settled in Brittany. And they, um, that's why the stories have a little kind of a Celtic feel to them. So this next story is from the 16th century and it is a Jewish story from Palestine. Long ago, there were three, three young men and the oldest of the young men was to be married the next day, and his name was Reuven. And they were out in the night, they were celebrating. It was not exactly a stag party, but it was definitely a celebration of his upcoming marriage. For he was marrying a young woman who he just loved, who was beautiful and wealthy, and a smooth path to the future lay before him. Now they were going through the woods, and the moon was bright, and they walked down by the river, and they were reclining on some rocks by the river. They were in such high spirits, they were almost, to be said, intoxicated. And they looked down, and there was a root coming up from the, under the sand. Looks just like a finger, said one, and he went over closer, and it was indeed a finger, a, a pale white woman's finger sticking up out of the sand. Who will put a ring on this finger, he said. And Reuben, who was to be married the next day, which should be me, for I am to be married. And he took off his signet ring, and he put it on the finger, and he went, you are betrothed to me, you are betrothed to me, you are betrothed to me, which was the custom, and that was a binding pledge. And any other time, the young men would have felt sad that there was a body buried in such a casual place, so shallow, but they were in too high spirits, but those high spirits were dashed because the finger began to twitch, and a hand reached up out of the sand, and then the whole long length began to quake, and a woman sat up. She was wearing a ragged shroud, and she looked at Reuven, and she said, my husband, and the young man, young men ran. And they ran back through the woods, and it was dark now, and the branches and the leaves were slapping in the face, but they could hear the corpse coming behind them. And they ran faster and faster until they got back to their village, and outside their houses, they agreed they would say nothing of this. And they each went inside and tried to sleep as best they could. Now, the next day was the wedding. And Reuven went to the ritual baths, and he got richly dressed. 
And when they went to the church, there were the families, and both of these young people were from large and wealthy families, so this, not the church, the synagogue was full of people. And just as the rabbi had called them up together, there came a terrible scream from the back of the church, and there stood the corpse bride, still in her shroud, and she pointed a hand and she says, what defect does he see in me that he chooses another bride? You can see, I have his ring. And she held up the hand that had on Reuben's signet ring. And everyone in the synagogue ran from every exit except for the rabbi and Reuben. And the woman came forward and she said, I did not have my hour of joy in life. And now I will have it in my death. And he turned, the rabbi turned, and he said, Reuven, did you put the ring on her finger? He said, I did. Did you say you were betrothed to me three times? I did. And were there two witnesses? There were. I can do nothing for you. For you, you are engaged to this, this, this woman. And Reuven fainted dead away. Now the parents of the groom came to the rabbi and begged him to find a way to get their son out of this marriage with a corpse. And the rabbi agreed that he would call together a court of the wisest men and they would talk about this. And they looked through all the books and scrolls, but there was no precedence. There was no other event so shocking that they could look at. And so they sat and talked. And the rabbi called the parents together of the bride and the groom, and they told him that when they were, before the children were even born, these two couples were friends, and they agreed if one had a boy and one had a girl, they would someday hope that they were married, and could that not serve as a previous engagement? And the rabbi thought, and he thought, and then he called all the interested parties together. And the corpse bride came in, dripping little bits of dirt, her ragged and worm-eaten shroud around her. And he told her, this is my decision. Yes, he made a vow to you, but there was a previous engagement. And a new one cannot negate the old one. And Reuven did not put the ring on you with intention. And besides, there is no marriage bonds between the living and the dead. And the corpse bride again gave a horrible scream and fell down a corpse once more. Now the rabbi decreed that this poor soul should be buried in a proper grave with all the rites and honors and a proper headstone even though they did not know her name. And the bride said that she would tend the grave for the rest of her marriage and she would make sure that it had flowers and was kept up for she had sympathy for this poor woman. And so the marriage took place, and Reuben and his bride married, and everybody, with as much jollity as they could, considering the circumstances, they had a glorious wedding, and they lived happily ever after. And that story is called The Corpse Bride, or sometimes The Finger. <laughs> and if you all know, there's a movie by Tim Burton where he took that story and made it the plot line for his movie. So that's a, a Jewish story from the 1600s. <laughs> Are we doing time pretty? We have time for a little bit more. <clears throat> this next one is one of the grimmer stories from the Brothers Grimm. There was once a princess, and she was very lovely, and her father was very wealthy, but she was a little odd. And she would marry no one unless that person agreed that if she were to die first, they would be buried with her, regardless of whether they were still alive or not. And she, of course, would do the same for them. She said, anyone who truly loves me would not want to be in the world after I am dead. And so, understandably, there were not many takers. But there was one young man, a poor young man, and he had had to leave his father's house because there was no food for the both of them. And he had gone and joined as a mercenary in the king's army. And he had fought so bravely that he was brought up in rank in the battlefield. And when he saved the king's life, the king said, oh, you must come to the palace and meet my daughter. 
Now the young man was so taken with the girl that he dismissed the idea of being buried with her. He said, well, chances are, chances are I will die first for I am a bit older. And so they married and they were happy for a time, but then the princess took a terrible cold and it came to pneumonia and indeed she died. And the king said, well, you know, you signed on to this agreement and I am going to make sure that it is carried out. So the princess was buried in a tomb and the young man was shut in the tomb with her and the gates were locked and he was left with three loaves of bread and three bottles of wine and that was all. And three candles. So he sat there and he nibbled at the bread. He didn't know whether to eat it all at once and get this over with or whether to parse it out and live as long as possible. So he was coming down to his last loaf of bread and his last little sip of wine and his last candle. And the princess's body was laid out on a great marble slab. So he was sitting there in the little twilight when he saw Two sna a snake come out. A snake came out of a crack in the wall and it seemed to be heading for the princess's body and he said, I have enough strength left to get you. And he pulled out his sword and he chopped the snake into three pieces. And then because he hadn't much strength left, he sat back down. So out of the same crack came a second snake and it looked at the first one and then it went back and when it came back, it had three green leaves in its mouth. And it put one leaf over the first cut and one leaf over the second and one leaf over the head. And the first snake put itself back together, came back to life, and both the snakes slithered away into a crack in the wall. Now the young man picked up the three snake leaves and he looked at his princess and he put one over her nose, one over her mouth, and one over her heart. And she took a big breath and color came back to her cheeks and she sat up and they pounded on the gate and finally they made the guards here and the guards came and they were amazed that the princess was standing up and living again. And the king was of course delighted. So the, the young man and the princess went back to living together and she had become odder still from her time in the grave but he was ready to dismiss that and they decided to take an ocean voyage, just the thing to bring her back to health. So they did, they got on a ship and they had a fine young captain to captain the ship. And the prince also brought, the young man brought along his servant, a loyal man who had been assigned to him to help him dress and comb his hair now that he was royalty. And into this man's keeping, he gave the three snake leaves. And the man put the snake leaves in his innermost pocket and promised to guard them well. Now the princess began to have feelings for the captain and they became stronger and stronger and she no longer loved her husband and she only had eyes for the captain of the ship and they began to plot. And the servant overheard them saying that they would drug the young man and they would throw him overboard and when they sailed back they would tell her father that he had died and been buried at sea. So the servant could not stop the drugging of the young man. So, but he could be there in a little lifeboat. So when the young man's body was thrown over the side, he fished it out. And he had the three snake leaves in his pocket and he put one on the young man's nose and his mouth and his heart. And the young man came back to life. Now he and the servant rode all the way back to the king's palace. And the king could not believe that his daughter, his daughter would do such a thing. But eventually he saw on the horizon the ship that he had sent his daughter off in. So he had the young man and the servant hide behind a curtain. And the daughter came in with the captain and she said, oh, a terrible thing has happened. My husband fell ill. We could do nothing for him. We, he was dead and we threw his body over and this captain has been such a, such a comfort to me. And when he heard his daughter tell the exact lie that her husband had said he would, he signaled to the young man to come out from behind the curtain. 
He disowned his daughter. He had holes poked in the bottom of the ship, and he had the captain and the young woman put in it and pushed offshore and let happen what they may. He made the young man king of his, of his whole country and made him his heir. And those three snake leaves were preserved for many years. And in fact, if you go to that country, they have been made part of the crest of the whole family. And that's from the Brothers Grimm called Three Snake Leaves. Not exactly Halloween, but I find the whole buried alive thing a little on the creepy side. I'm going to end with a local ghost story. So you all are doubtless familiar with the CNO Canal. And you know that it was built, it wasn't quite finished, but it was sort of in use during the Civil War. Well, there was a young man coming home. And he had been on the losing side of the war. And when you were on the losing side, there was no train ride for you. There were no wagons. The horses were all gone. If you wanted to get home, you walked. And he had been walking and walking. And he would have looked like just any of many dusty, tired soldiers except he had this fine white dog with him. And everybody who saw that dog wanted to pet it and pat it. And it was so tied to the boy that it would not be out of his sight and walked always right at his heels. But the young man was tired and ill. And he was so tired that one day he leaned, down, leaned back against a tree. And the next day, passers-by found him that he had died, with the dog right there beside him. Now, they buried the young man. He had not a piece of paper or a letter. They had no idea who he was. So they dug a grave not far from the path and buried him there. And they tried to catch the dog. They offered it meat. They offered it water. They tried to pet it and play with it. But the dog would not come anywhere near them. And after another couple weeks, they found the dog lying on the boy's grave, also dead. And they buried him along with the young man. But that was not the last time they saw him. People began to see right at twilight this fine white dog walking up and down the canal path. And when people would come to visit, they'd say, oh, I see you got a new dog. He's such a fine looking dog. And the people would say, no, no, we, we did not get a dog. And every now and again, people will pass in the evening along the canal, and they will see this beautiful white dog. And he looks friendly. You can speak to him. He wags his tail, but he won't let you get close to him. So if you are out on this Halloween night, if you are trick-or-treating or your children anywhere down there, and you see a fine white dog approaching you, throw him a stick. Tell him he's a good boy, because he's been alone for a long time. And that's the end. <laughs> so, thank you. And thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a nice, suitably spooky Halloween evening. <laughs>